Hey, thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, as I get older, these these introductions get more and more amazing. Uh, and uh, welcome to all, and congratulations to all these amazing graduates who are here today. Uh, to the other students in the audience, to the families who got you here, and to the faculty uh, at UCLA's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And thank you to uh, Dean Karen uh, Sears um, for inviting me here uh, to speak to you. So, Fridays, usually at night, like this Friday, I look at my email and social media posts and things like that, looking for those personal notes that have come to me during the week. It's my only time to sort of answer when people write to me. And I have a few every week, and they're from all over the world. They're often from people from um, other countries, different races, mostly young. And once you read these, some are asking for a job, but many of them basically are at a crossroads. And they usually ask me something like this. They say, I'm amazed that you get to do what you love. I love nature as well. Now, can you tell me how do I get to do what you do? And it's a really, really difficult question to answer, right? It's really difficult. Usually I'm kind of being a bit of a smart ass and I'm writing something like, you know, it's 10 p.m. at night on Friday, I'm in my office, I'm answering this email. That should tell you a little bit about what it takes to get to do what I do. But when I really think about it, people love to connect the dots. But you can only really connect dots when you look backwards. If Hansel and Gretel, you know, you know, that story, you know, they were putting the breadcrumbs behind them, right? If they had put a little bit of forethought into where they were going, as opposed to, you know, putting those breadcrumbs, we wouldn't have had a story today, right? So it's really difficult to look and connect dots and then figure out what that means for your future. But for my life, one of my biggest moments uh, that really defined who I was and what I would do with my life came because, essentially, of a setback. So I, uh, as Peter said, grew up in Africa, and I came to the United States and went to graduate school, uh, and because I had this love for nature, and my parents didn't beat it out of me as a child, and I had, to, had the opportunity to sort of, sort of grow with it. I, by the way, I fooled them for many years that I was in pre-med, which is what every Asian who's basically not doing pre-med does, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. But um, I wanted to I wanted to study wildlife, and I wanted to study wildlife in Africa. And I had my heart set on studying cheetahs, you know, the big cat, the spotted cat of the African plains. That's what I, what I was going to do. And for two years, I went through all my uh, coursework um, during my PhD. I defended my proposal. Uh, I had the funding ready for it. And I was actually in Washington, D.C., getting a research visa from the country of Namibia, which is a real country, country of Namibia, where I was going to go study cheetahs. And I get a phone call. Back in the day, it's a real phone. You got to go downstairs and pick up something and put coins in it. And it was my advisor on the other end basically saying, and I went to school at UC Santa Cruz, and he basically said, uh, come back, your project has been canceled. And so I flew back, and it turned out, nothing to do with my, myself, this is another long story, and I'm not going to tell it here today, but basically the funding for my project got nixed by the U.S. government. They got into a fight with the San Diego Zoo, San Diego Zoo was actually funding me, and so here I was, two years into my graduate work, without a project, with a visa, and with the time ticking down on my visa clock and I had to do something really fast. And I looked around and the only thing I could see that no one would care about whether I studied them or not, no one would interfere with my work, and they were plentiful in California, were gophers. You know, like pocket gophers? They're like these little rats that burrow underground, right? So that's what I did. I went and studied gophers for my PhD. So, I abandoned this dream of sitting in my khakis with Swarovskis around my neck on top of a Land Rover in the African savanna with a gin and tonic in my hand, watching a family of cheetahs under the acacia tree, to basically two years of on my knees, digging in the dirt, trying to find these gophers. <laughs> my advisor basically gave me a copy of Caddyshack and said, 
watch Bill Murray, he'll tell you everything you need to know about catching gophers. And it is true. You know, it's really hard to catch these things. Now, where are gophers found in California? They're found throughout California, but a big population of gophers lives in the Central Valley. Now, if you're a biologist, let's be honest, the excitement is on the coast or in the mountains. The Central Valley is that middle part of the part of the state that you drive through as fast as you can to get to the other side, to get to the Sierras. But that's where I had to go, right? So, you know, this is ag country, ranching country, laser leveled. Um, I was a bit scared, I'll be honest. So I got myself a pickup truck. I got a dog and put the dog in the back of the pickup truck. Australian Shepherd. I put all kinds of sports stickers on my truck. None of it said banana slugs, by the way. That would be a dead giveaway as to my sort of inclinations, right? And then I drove up into the Central Valley. I drove to ranchers and farmers. I'd drive down that driveway carefully. I'd let the dog out first. That was always a good introduction. Then I'd walk up to the door and knock on the door and basically say, hey, do you mind if I catch some gophers on your land? <laughs> and, you know, like no one said no. <laughs> Most ranchers and farmers were amazed that this is what I wanted to do. And over time, I got to know them a little bit. I got to drive around with them, with them in their trucks and with their dogs. And we would talk because I'd spend a lot of time in their field. By the way, I never told them that this was a catch and release study. So at night, I'd just come back and put the gophers back out there. <laughs> I, just, I just avoided that part of the story. And so what did I learn? I, what did I learn from this community that I would in no way ever meet in any other form of life? I learned that they love the land, just like I do. I learned that they know exactly when the crickets would sing and when the first day of frost would show up. I, kn I knew that they, you know, I learned that they knew where the coyotes would den, when the bluebirds would start nesting. They loved the land. They were frightened for the changes they were seeing on their land. They cared about water. They cared about their kids having a way of life that was similar to their own. And I realized that we had a lot in common in terms of how we saw nature and what we appreciated about it. We were just speaking different languages. Where for me, it was a language of love. I love nature. I love the bluebirds. I love the river. Theirs was a language of value. I value this water, right? And that lesson really stayed with me for all of my life. It's really defined the way in which I approach conservation, and frankly, my organization, Conservation International, approaches conservation, and to be fair, many other organizations do as well today. That's a big change that I've seen happen. Love alone is not enough. It's okay, don't get me wrong, I'm not hiding the fact that I love nature. I have a place in Montana. I like to go to Montana because I like going for a walk in the woods knowing that there's something bigger than me and scarier than me that can come out and take my head off. But that's just me, right? The value proposition of let's save the forest because something could kill you is just not a value proposition for most people on the planet. And so if you want people to start thinking about climate change, if you want people to start thinking about environmentalism or conservation or wildlife, you have to meet them where they are. You can't just say, jump over here because this is the right side of the road or the right side of the stream or right side of the path. You have to be willing to go more than halfway. You have to meet them where they are and you have to frame what you care about in language that they can adopt and appreciate. Because at the end of the day, what you do want is you want people to save nature because it is in their own enlightened self-interest, not in your enlightened self-interest. You want people to save nature because it really is ultimately about saving ourselves. So that's something that has really kind of stuck with me. You know, embrace those setbacks. Today, on this day where you're making a giant leap, when it's a big day for your family, when you have all the right to be proud of what you've accomplished so far, you know, remember that those setbacks in your life, only in retrospect, will, will, sh will, will, will stand out as sh shining moments when you could think different. And look, it's okay for a little while to fake it too, right? Everyone says be authentic, and I, I agree, be authentic. But a little faking it can go a long way as well. I faked it when I drove up to those ranchers, and I had to because I had to find a way to walk in their shoes a little bit. And 
doing that for a while made me understand the lives they lead and the things that they care about. And that was really, really insightful for me. It's okay to pretend that you fit if it means that you're going to learn something new. The other part of that note that I often get, and I try and respond those Friday nights, is that first part which says, you must love nature. And it's true, I, I love nature. But here's the really important thing. Everyone will tell you, do what you love. That's the way you succeed in life. That's really not very useful. I love sitting on a beach with a spicy margarita. That's not going to get me very far. It's much more important to do what you're good at, right? You were good at it before you came to college. During college, you probably honed those skills. You know honestly, truthfully, deep down inside what you're actually good at. Not what other people want you to be good at, not what your parents want you to be good at, what you're good at. You know, it took me like 50 years to figure out that what I was really good at, well, not 50 years, it took me like 30 years to really figure out <laughs> that I was good at telling stories. That was like my superpower. So what I have done is taken my degrees and put them to the service of what I'm good at, not the other way around. So figure that out for yourself. Ask yourself, what am I really good at? And then put your degree, put what you've learned here today, put what you've learned here this past four years to the service of what you're good at. And don't worry too much about being in love with what you do. If you're good at two things, that's even better. It's much harder to be really, really good at one thing than being pretty good at two different things. But when you combine those things, you're pretty unique. And the last thing is about that uniqueness. Embrace those differences. You know, the fact that I could go into that ranch and knock on that door and folks could see me at that time in my life and be willing to give me a ride around their ranch and vice versa was really important. Be able to embrace those differences. It's what makes you stand out, right? It immediately makes you stand out. I'm sitting up here, I'm looking around this audience, you know, I notice a bunch of gentlemen over there with cowboy hats and, and, and boots over there. It's instant. It's instant. They stand out. That's a hugely important thing. You walk into a room, you walk into, if you're going into conservation, if you're going into biology, if you're going into environmentalism, being able to stand out is half the game. What you do with it then, of course, matters. But I have managed to embrace it. For one year, I went to school in England. I was bullied mercilessly, like this was an all-boys school. It was like Hogwarts without any of the magic, so just sort of imagine that. And I tried to fit in, and that was really hard, but I didn't realize that embracing my difference is what's going to make it for me. It's how you can get noticed on a world of seven billion people. Now, when I say be different or embrace that difference, it doesn't necessarily only mean how you look. It's also how you act. You know, today, if you want to do something fun with your family while they're here this week, go watch that new documentary that's out there. It's called Won't You Be My Neighbor. It's the Fred Rogers documentary. Now, the parents know who Fred Rogers was, Mr. Rogers. The documentary is unbelievable. Vox, not Fox, Vox. Vox called it a radically subversive documentary. Can you imagine Mr. Rogers being subversive? And that's exactly what he was, right? He embraced differences. He respected one another. He led with kindness. A previous spoke, speaker spoke about community and kindness. I live in Washington, D.C. I know that leading with kindness makes you stand out. So as you go out today, go out to the rest of your life, act with kindness, and be subversive. Thank you. <laughs>